from Mind Force Radio. This is Natural Strength Night with Maximum Bob. On Natural Strength Night, we don't talk about the other things Bob likes to talk about. Tonight, we only talk strength training. When I say strength training, I don't mean training like punk-ass goons in the muscle magazines who jacked up on juice, steroids, and PEDs. I mean natural strength. Strength built on good food, heavy weights, and no shortcuts. If you want to learn about real natural strength, weight training the right way, the old school way, stick around. Bob and his friends just might teach you something. He's here, the host of Natural Strength Night, Maximum Bob Whalen. Our first guest tonight is Steve Baldwin. I've known Steve for close to 20 years, and he's one of the nicest guys in the strength training field, a field that is filled with many not-so-nice guys. <laughs> and Steve and his wife, Janet, also came to many of my Capital City Strength Clinics that I had in Washington, D.C. Steve and Janet own a personal training business in Memphis, Tennessee called Just Strength Training. It's one of the best personal training operations in the country. Steve has over 46 years of experience in strength training. He's competed in both Olympic lifting and power lifting. He holds an MS degree in fitness and wellness and has certifications from ACSM and NSCA. As a private strength coach, he has supervised over 50,000 strength training workouts. Steve will give you good, solid advice you can take to the bank. You gave me a list of some people that have had a great influence on your career. And the first one on your list was John Grimmick. Well, I, I met John Grimmick through Harold Weiss. Who, uh, Harold was a longtime training enthusiast from here in Memphis. He passed away in 1997, but he and John Grimmick were great friends. And Mr. Grimmick visited Memphis many times over the years. And I met uh, Mr. Grimmick through Harold. And then I started getting these indexed postcards that Mr. Grimmick would type out after we met. And I got a phone call from him. And I would be at Harold's house sometimes. And he would call and Harold would come over and say, hey, someone wants to speak with you on the phone. And Mr. Grimmick was the most accessible, nice, down-to-earth guy. And he was so enthused about, he wanted to talk about the person he was talking to his training, not his own. He didn't want to talk about anything that he had ever done. And I told him that I had a couple of uh, rare magazines with, with uh, this. He was on the cover. And he said, well, th he said, don't break up your collection. He said, keep those, he said, because I'm at the age where I'm getting rid of things right now. And he said, I've got magazines everywhere, you know. And uh, I just found him to be a really modest, uh, down to earth guy. Yeah, I remember that time. That remember you sent me those magazine covers. Yeah, I sure do. Right. Yeah, that was, that was about ten years ago. Yeah. See, yeah, I've, I've, sure I've, I've I've known Steve a long time, and he knows I'm a big John Grimmick fan. And about ten years ago, uh, Steve photocopied all of his covers. It must have been at least ten of them, maybe twelve, but. They were all the strength and health covers that John Grimmick was on. It, maybe not all, but most. And he, you even went out and got them laminated for me. That was so nice of you. And you sent me this package, and I was like, oh, my God, what is this? And uh, I covered a wall of my gym with them. And it, it was, after you uh, sent me those, it was called the John Grimmick Wall. I have so, a John uh, Grimmick Wall. <laughs> that's <laughs> oh, that's great. pretty cool. <laughs> that's yeah. great. I also visited Grimmick once uh, in 1976. I, I drove to York, Pennsylvania when I was in the Air Force, when I was coming home on leave. And I, I drove from Castle Air Force Base, California, all the way to York, Pennsylvania, because I was driving to Massachusetts, so I thought I would go that way just so I could see York, you know. And when I drove in there, uh, I, I was sad because Bob Hoffman wasn't there, but Grimmick was. And I got to go up and meet Grimmick and I spent like a half an hour in his office. I wrote about that in a few articles. But um, you're right. He was such a nice guy. He, he was so nice, and he spent most of the time talking to me about my training. You're right. What are some of the, the biggest tips you can remember, training tips you can remember from John Grimmick? Well, you know, I didn't really talk training as much with him as we talked about family and just uh, 
everyday things, but I do remember he was big on the wrist roller. He loved the wrist roller, and, uh, you know, we were talking about training the hands and the forearms. Right. And boy, he, even as an older man, he had forearms, boy. I love the wrist roller, too. I, I do that. That's, that's one of my staples. And I, I always make my clients do a wrist roller at the end of the workout. They usually complain about it because at the end of the workout, you're tired. But um, it, it's a good way to end a workout if we don't do a well, finisher I, or something like that. But now I'm, I'm in, a, I'm in a, like a condo community now. I'm not at Whalen Strength Training anymore in D.C., so we're not going to be outside doing sandbags where I am now, so we finished with the wrist right. roller. I, I went to Home Depot yesterday and bought different sized dowels and made a half a dozen wrist rollers of all different sizes. Vic Boff, he's on your list too. Yeah, Mr. Boff was the same. You know, I, I met him through the uh, old-time Barbell Strongman Association, and he would call about three times per, per year promoting the dinner, and he was uh, always very gracious, but he would tell me about old-timers who had passed away, and uh, he would, he, was, he talked with Janet, my wife, another guy, just a fantastic personality. Right, he was great. And uh, Bob Hoffman. Well, I tell you, an interesting story about Bob Hoffman that I've never seen printed. I uh, They ran my account of Bob Hoffman meeting Joe Weider in 1978 in the old hard training magazine. But in St. Louis in December 1978, there was a Heart of America lifting contest and bodybuilding championship. And Joe Weider was there and also Bob Hoffman and John Turpak. Well, uh, people, long time Enthusiasts know about the feud between Hoffman and Weider. They were terrible to each other in their uh, respective magazines. They just challenged each other to fights and basically slandered each other back and forth, you know, month to month. Well, I'm in the uh, restaurant sitting with a friend of mine from Memphis, and we see Joe Weider standing there, and there's some professional bodybuilders in the restaurant a couple of tables over. And Bob Hoffman comes in and walks across the floor and runs smack dab into Weeder. They bump into each other. It was like an E.F. Hutton commercial where everyone's quiet, like, what's going to happen here? Hmm. You know, they've been going back and forth at this point for 40 years. Well, they shake hands, exchange pleasantries, you know, how are you doing? Good to see you. Mr. Hoffman goes on his way, and Weeder comes on in, and the bodybuilders start teasing him. Hey, we thought you were going to fight. What's the matter? Are you afraid of him? And all Joe said was, you know, you got to be civil in public. And that's <laughs> it. That's how they met. But they actually shook hands. <laughs> wow. That, that's a pretty good story. Because oh, most of the people in the, in the room were of the age where they realized the significance of them running into each other. And so, you know, it was with bated breath. We all watched, you know, what's going to happen here? You know? Yeah, they probably, at an age where they're, at least Hoffman was, he's probably getting too old to fight at that age. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and, I, and I'm not sure uh, Hoffman at that point was, uh, I'm not sure mentally how, you know, he was slipping a little bit maybe, and Weider probably realized, they both probably realized you have to be civil and public. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, now what about uh, John Turpak? Well, no, I, I met Mr. Turpak in, in York in the uh, early 80s. I went to the museum there, and he came in, and... Uh, he, again, was easy to talk to, very accessible. Uh, we talked about the old days. And, uh, you know, apparently, it, 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 there was no one there. It was surprising. The day that I went to York Barbell, that day, mm-hmm. there was no one there. So he he acted like he really enjoyed having someone who was enthusiastic to talk to. I went down that particular week. They were closing the old barbell club. Mm-hmm. So I went down to take a look at it, and it was it was amazing. All these trophies and medals from past years were just laying there on the floor like they were going to throw them out, I guess. You know, it was just, uh, they were moving out, and it didn't appear that anyone there had any regard for the history, but I, I guess, you know, if they'd wanted it, they would have taken it to, to the museum, but it looked like a lot of stuff was just going to be hauled out. Yeah, when I went there that day, the same day in 76, I also went in the gym there, and uh, 
I can't really say I met him, but I, I saw John Turpak in there. I think I just said hi to him, but I didn't really talk to him. But uh, remember Lee James? I think yeah. he won the silver medal. And remember Mark Cameron? Yeah. They were both Absolutely. Olympic lifters back then. Well, they were both in there working out. So I saw Turpak, but I spent about an hour with Lee James and Mark Cameron watching them work out, and I was talking with them. They were both extremely friendly and uh, answering all my questions. I was watching them train, and uh, it, was, it was a great time. I mean, it was just amazing how you could just walk into York back then. It was like you could walk in and meet, you know, Hoffman or Grimmick and walk into the gym, and it was like it, there was no security or anything. I just walked right in. Yeah. They were really accessible, weren't they? Yeah, it's amazing. Now, the next guy on your list is Arthur Jones. Well, I, you know, I read all of Arthur's writings starting from the very beginning, the first articles that he wrote in Muscular Development in 1970. And then, you know, he had an influence on my training, so I was keeping it brief and intense. But I saw him at the University of Florida at one of the uh, – MedEx Back Machine Lectures, which was an mm -hmm. all-day program. And it was really entertaining to see this man with a ninth-grade education come in and lecture all these ortho and neurosurgeons on the low back. MDs were probably not accustomed to listening to someone, particularly someone without a formal education, but they listened intently to everything he was saying and you know, they asked great questions, but his wit and his intellect were somewhat intimidating, I've got to tell you, because I was a little afraid to ask a question, because he could be sharp. What about Dr. Ken Cooper? I know he's mainly an aerobics guy, but you put him on your list. Well, I was, uh, I went to his facility twice for training, for a certification program, and I worked for FedEx, and they sent me down there two different occasions, 86 and 87. And one year I was in the uh, cafeteria early in the morning. It was probably about 6.30 in the morning. And I was the only one in there. And I look up, and there comes Dr. Cooper in his white lab coat. And I see he's walking right up to me, and I'm the only one there. He walks up and says, do you mind if I sit with you while you eat? And so I, I stood up and said, I'd be honored to, you know, to have you share breakfast with me. And he sat down, and again, a very nice guy, but at the time, he didn't believe in strength training at all. It was all Yeah, he negative. changed his mind on that later. That was good. Right. He did. He did. And, you know, you've got to admire someone who makes a 180-degree turn because, you know, it was obvious that he was wrong after a while, and he, he came around and admitted it. So that, that's very admirable. He had a huge Again, impact uh, on fitness in this country and in the world. Huge. He's yeah, one of the yeah. giants in fitness. A very nice, uh, again, a very nice guy. You know, the funny thing, I'll tell you a story about Arthur Jones when he came in and, and he made all the physical therapists mad because he said, uh, he said something to the effect of that we now have a machine that will de detect if someone is faking a low back injury. Hmm. He said what that means the industry, he said, it could save millions, if not billions of dollars. But he said, what it means to you physical therapists, you're going to have to get off your butts and go to work. He said, because right now all you do is change ice packs every 30 minutes. And it was funny when he said that, two or three of the lady therapists, they got up and left. They were like, that's enough of that. But it was, <laughs> it was really funny. I mean, he, when he got through, it was, to me, it was not a... It was not malicious. It was just funny the way that he would insult people. You know? The next question, Steve, are there any special exercises that can help prevent or improve carpal tunnel syndrome? That's real popular now with everyone on the computer all the time. And I, I had a lot of people that uh, had that, that worked at the post office, too. They were mail sorters. What, what would you advise for that? Well, I've, I've dealt with a couple of people who suffered with carpal tunnel syndrome, and we do a, a wrist, wrist flexion stretch, which just the standard wrist, wrist flexion stretch, which you can see on YouTube. Uh, then wrist extension stretch. There's the prayer stretch where you put the palms of your hands together and bring them down mm -hmm. the chest level, pushing in. And then a lot of finger extensions with thick rubber bands seems to help. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. The preventive 
and for people who've already suffering with carpal tunnel. The wrist roller, Titan's telegraph key, um, a lever bar, like they used to call that the, the weaver stick. But um, a- any kind of grip work is good because repetitive motion is what the, the muscles in your hands and fingers and wrists just repetitively doing things over and over and over. It's whenever you work those muscles and they do something different, it helps them. It's a, it's it's not just muscle related. It's also nerve related too. But there's lots of benefits from doing grip work. I've got a couple of a little apparatus that we do finger extensions with. You can even put your hands in a like a Dixie cup and try to open them forcefully as hard as you can to counteract the squeezing. We we do so much squeezing. You know, and so the rubber bands are opening against a cup or the physical therapists have little tools that they use for resistance for finger extension. But the finger extension exercises seem to be a good counter to all this gripping to to keep the muscles strong that actually do extension. Yeah, the next one, Steve, is uh, from a 40-year-old guy who's 6'3 and weighs 250, and his goal is to lose some body fat and get down to 220. And he's currently training whole body twice a week, and his uh, program consists of bench press, seated rows, military press, chins, and he alternates squats and deadlifts once a week each. He wants to know, are there any diet or training modifications that you'd recommend to him? Well, I think the exercise frequency and the choice of exercises sounds great as long as they all agree with him orthopedically. But one thing from 40, definitely over 40, perfect exercise form, both to have an accurate standard to compete against in the future and also for safety so there won't be any injuries. Also, uh, maybe special attention to the rear shoulder, some external rotation work or some what they call the chest expander cables, some uh, special attention for the rear shoulder to protect the shoulders. As far as diet goes, I I like a Mediterranean-type diet, but there are probably others that are similar, that are healthy. Maybe a 10% reduction in calories for a very slow weight loss so there won't be any loss of lean. I mean, losing muscle is the worst thing that you can do. So if you're aiming for weight loss, while you're training to get stronger, I think you want to try to make it as slow as possible, maybe just one or two pounds a week and maybe just one pound a week to try to keep as much lean as possible. Thank you very much, Steve. It was great having you on the show. Well, I sure appreciate it. Thank you. We'll be back with more right after this. This segment brought to you by VitalNutritionStore.com. Did you know that more than 7 million Americans suffer from coronary heart disease, the most common form of heart disease? Regardless of your age or condition, adding Cardio for Life to your daily regime will dramatically improve your cardiovascular condition. Cardio for Life has been the top-selling Enlarger 9 product in the marketplace now for more than three years. It is also the top-selling product at VitalNutritionStore.com. Formulated by Dr. Harry Elwart, the best-selling author of Let's Stop the Number One Killer of Americans Today, Dr. Harry believes together we can prevent and reverse heart disease. Cardio for Life comes in three wonderful flavors, orange, peach, and grape, and is gluten-free, sugar-free, and sodium-free. Please see our complete line of natural products at vitalnutritionstore.com. That's V-I-T-A-L nutritionstore.com. Randy Roach shocked the world with the release of his first volume of Muscle Smoke and Mirrors several years ago. It was a masterpiece of over 500 pages with such in-depth research and detail that it was not only surprising, but shocking and mind-blowing. It was truly one of the best Iron Game history books ever written. He followed that with Volume 2, another epic book with over 700 pages of equal depth and detail. All serious Iron Game fans need to have these books. Please visit Randy's website at randyroach.ca. That's R-A-N-D-Y-R-O-A-C-H dot C-A. Listen to how Iron Game legend and the Iron Master editor, Osmo Kihaw, describes the book Supernatural Strength. Have you ever wondered how much real-world experience authors have when they write books about weight training? Who is that person behind the computer? What do they really know about the Iron Game? 
If you picked up this book, Supernatural Strength, you have definitely come to the right place. The author, Bob Whalen, has spent several decades in the Iron Game trenches training himself, competing and coaching in powerlifting, earning academic credentials too numerous to mention, and thousands of hours of training and instructing athletes and trainees of all levels at his Washington, D.C. gym since 1990. He's not only devoted his life to motivating and pushing people to heights they have never been to, but elevating the trainees' understanding why certain methods work better than others. Bob is one of the most respected and revered trainers in the business today. This book is sure to surprise and amaze you at the same time. Order now at SupernaturalStrength.com. That's SupernaturalStrength.com. Don't you think it would be so much easier getting into shape if you had a personal coach? Just like all the celebrities do. Well, now you can. Bob Whalen of WebStrengthCoach.com wants to get you out of your rut and coach you to success. He's dedicated to helping you achieve your strength and fitness goals through your hard work and his expert guidance. Bob will help you with strength training, muscle building, fitness, nutrition, and motivation. He'll make sure you achieve your maximum physical potential. You can get one-on-one -on -one training with Bob through his website webstrengthcoach.com he will develop a personalized program tailored to your individual needs a program right for you bob will give you feedback after every workout this is old school fitness and nutrition no fads and no gimmicks bob will use proven natural techniques to make sure you are satisfied so visit webstrengthcoach.com today and let bob help you reach your best self webstrengthcoach.com do you enjoy history without social engineering? Reading about our founding fathers? Economics from a capitalist perspective? Wisdom from modern patriots? Welcome to UncleSamBooks.com, where virtues like rugged individualism, hard work, and the American dream dominate. UncleSamBooks.com. Great books for homeschooling. UncleSamBooks.com. If you want to become as strong and muscular as possible with health in mind and without lowering yourself to using steroids, the best advice can be found in the classic strongman books of long ago. These are the best books ever written on the subjects of strength training, weightlifting, strongman training, iron game history, and old time physical culture. Many of them can still be found at physicalculturebooks.com. There you will find good, Honest, time-tested wisdom from the great old-time strongmen. To maximize your natural muscular and strength potential, please visit physicalculturebooks.com. Listen to Ken Manny, head strength and conditioning coach at Michigan State University, describe the book Iron Nation. A masterpiece text on some of the most intriguing and compelling personal stories, iron game history, and gut-wrenching training routines ever put to paper. If you truly love hard training without all the frills of pomp and circumstance so common today, you will love Iron Nation. Written by lifters for lifters. If you love weight training, you will love Iron Nation. Order now at ironnation.com. That's I R O N nation.com. If you would like to promote your business on Mindforce Radio, we would love to hear from you. Please let us know if you are interested in a 30 or 60 second voice commercial or a banner website ad. Please contact Bob using the contact information provided on MindForceRadio.com. You're listening to Natural Strength Night on Mindforce Radio. <laughs> And our next guest is Coach Connor, true blue, classy gentleman. I love having Coach Connor on the show. If you're serious about strength training and you live within driving distance of Evansville, Indiana, then you must go get a workout from Dick. For more information, visit the Pitt website. It's thepitbarbellclub.com. That's thepitbarbellclub.com. 
Uh, welcome back, Dick. Thank you. Uh, I, that was a very interesting conversation. It, it was almost amazing because in front of me, when you guys started talking, I thought I'd better jot down a couple of things. I had wrote this before the Heart of America contest was brought up. I wrote Bob Hoffman and Joe Weider at Heart of America contest, St. Louis. Mike <laughs> Menser with Joe Weider. I was at that contest with a couple of guys that I trained. And how that got in that conversation, and and he had such a detail of remembering stuff, his, his conversation with you was really interesting. Uh, I can tell he's a, really an educated young man. Um, the one thing he didn't say was Menser was with Joe Weider <laughs> at that contest. And... Uh, it was a remarkable thing to have all those people together. The guy that run that contest uh, had a heck of a gym. Over, I can't remember his name. He was a real good friend of of uh, Joe Gold, and he designed equipment and et cetera. He was uh, really good in this field. But uh, I, I really enjoyed your last conversation there. Yes, yeah, Steve was great. I hope we can get him on again. Oh, man, he's a very educated guy. He's very interesting to, to listen to, and he got a good memory. I start, but that's funny. I wrote down, I don't know why I wrote the Heart of America down there. But got, uh, I just thought I ought to have something to talk about. In some way, his conversation got me to start thinking, and I wrote that stuff down even before he really got it out of his mouth. Because I remember how Bob Hoffman and Joe Weider were there. And, um, uh, you know, what a different kind of a deal that was uh and and, and other great lifters were there uh, it, it was just uh, there i've never been to a contest that had so many uh great names you know that, out of the magazines and up and coming super lifters it was a heck of a contest you said some great things last week and i want to touch on a few things again because it's worth rehearing last week you talked about <clears throat> training with leo stern and um, it was very interesting. Uh, I know in the 1950s you were stationed in San Diego with the Navy and you trained with Leo Stern. Could you go over again some of the, the biggest things that you learned from training with him? Well, you know, he he made your workout for you if you so desired. And I had been told, you know, by a guy who was extremely well built and in the Philippines, that that's where I ought to learn something. So I went there when I got back. That was the home port of the ship I was on. I went there and joined, and uh, he made my workout. Uh, what type of exercises or what type of routine did he... He didn't... All he did was make your workout, show you how to do it, and you can question him on it, but as far as training with you like you have personal training nowadays... There was no such thing then. Uh, that that was probably, he was probably ahead of his time. Uh, I remember going in Joe Gold's gym, and it had, he had a, the biggest sign in the gym was, if you don't know how to train, go somewhere else. Literally, that was the biggest <laughs> sign in the gym. Wow. If you don't know how to train, go somewhere else. I said, Joe, I want to look at your, <laughs> I want to look at your gym. He said, look at it. <laughs> so I looked. <laughs> you well, know, those guys... Again, there was no such thing as personal training. I, there was no such thing as a personal trainer. Um, and I would bug people. I, 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 it wasn't so much that I had the personality to do it with, but I, I, I was so interested in trying to get better that I would bug people. And, of course, I told you about Bill Golumbic, who was fifth in Mr. America that year, and that was... It was a time when, when Mr. America, if you had fifth, that was there wasn't a dozen categories. There wasn't a dozen contests. The only contest held in the world I ever knew anything about them was America, of, of, you know, a real high echelon, America, the USA, and Mr. Universe in Europe. That was it. And he got fifth, and, he, and I questioned him and, you know, how to get bigger, and he told me, squat. <laughs> and... Uh, even the equipment, I mean, there wasn't even machines, not even universal machines back then. And no. the, the, the benches were, most people don't realize this, but powerlifting as a sport didn't even start until the 1950s. Prior to that, 
when you were growing up as a kid, you never – see, right now the ego lift is the bench press. But I bet when you were growing up, it was how much can you press? Because even when I right. was growing up, I, I still remember that. It's like how much can you press? But it was only Olympic lifting, and, and the press was the ego lift. But hardly anybody lifted, so it didn't really matter. After the 50s, that's when powerlifting took over, and that became more popular than Olympic lifting. And that's, you know, what made the bench press so popular. But people used to do benches on the, you know, if you look at some of the old uh, magazines, they had people on the floor doing bench presses. That They didn't even call it bench press, and they call it like prone press or whatever. There really wasn't even such a thing as the bench press the way we do it now back then. Yes, uh in fact, it's one of the first things I, that I seen Bill Golumbic do. That uh, when I walked in that gym on Saturday, it was almost nobody there. It, it was all I, I would been out there. You know, I, I was that was in the early that was in the middle fifties, and I was there in eighty one, and then I was there again in two thousand four at what was no longer Leo's gym. He was still alive, but he had sold it. But in in eighty one, me and three guys went out there, and looked at the place and it was pretty much the same the thing that got me about Golumbic he was the first guy I seen when I walked in the gym on a Saturday afternoon and there was hardly nobody in there he comes down off of a ladder that went up through the roof where he was up on a roof sun tanning and it had a it had a, a trap door type thing where you could go up on the roof and when he come down they had a place on the floor that, that he walked over to he flipped up on his hands this thing was probably two foot up where you had this two pedestals, and he started doing handstand push-ups. He probably weighed 195 foot seven. He done them things so easy I could hardly believe it. Hmm. Nobody at the pit could do it right now, and I've seen one guy uh, years ago that used to train at the Y do it. The handstand push-up, which come off a of muscle beach, you know, is, is a great upper body exercise, you know, if you can spend the time learning how to do it because the shoulder development is is, is really something. Uh, it's like like Paul Anderson. I knew Paul Anderson. Uh, brought him here one time to speak to young people to Evansville, and he believed, whether you know it or not, I don't know if you know it or not, but he believed, for instance, an up down upside-down leg press he said, the blood goes out of your legs. It ain't a good exercise. You should try and get the blood into the area, not out of the area. So he had his beliefs, you know. But the handstand push-up, Paul Anderson could do handstand push-ups. Mm. 300 and some odd pound man. You know, it's, that's a, something from the past that was a great exercise. Probably missed out a lot nowadays. And everybody, like you said, gets caught up in the bench. But the bench is a good exercise. You said another interesting thing last week. Uh, you said that there are more serious lifters now in Evansville, Indiana, than there were in the entire country back in the 1950s. And I think you're right about that. But that yeah. just shows how much lifting has changed. It's amazing. I mean, when I was a kid growing up, I remember being told by coaches, by everybody, you know, not to lift weights or you know, there, there were some that lifted, but most coaches would tell you they weren't in favor of it, and and most people didn't lift weights. I mean, you were in a in a rare group if you trained, but now everyone does. I don't know how we, we were so prejudiced against everything back in those days. Uh, I think America had a lot of good people in it. Don't get me wrong, but we were the, so prejudiced against everything that we didn't understand or trust or whatever. How we got that way, I don't know. But I remember the football coach kicking guys off the team for swimming. They went swimming after football practice. And he kicked them off because he said swimming would run you. And weightlifting, the funny thing about it is his best player was a weightlifter. He didn't know it, you know. And, and the fastest guy on the team but, of course, these guys believe. I had an awful problem uh, back in the 60s training guys with because coaches. I had two coaches come to my house literally and come in my basement because I started it in my basement, uh, the gym, and uh, I had all kind of problems with coaches. I mean, it was unbelievable. Uh, but everybody, they, they believe with all their heart that I was going to make their people slow. 
What advice would you give a competitive power lifter? I, I, I train, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm only training two power lifters now, and I just do it because I like to. I, I, I train other people, but as far as power lifting, I'm only training two guys. And there's a but you're pretty a, good. You're still a Hall of Fame. You're a Hall of Fame coach, so. <laughs> you're well, modest. I ignore a lot of their training. I tell you that, uh, that, that right there at the gym, I ignore. But if they ask me, I tell them, you know, you won't last unless mm-hmm. you learn how to control the weight. And it, it you know, um, I, I don't care what it is, and it, it, explosive training is dangerous and will, without a doubt, cause you some kind of injury. I have had, in, in, over the years, three guys off of our team had neck injuries that l- led to mm-hmm. surgeries right? and other things that have happened until, you know, I learned how to train people correctly. It cost me and it cost them. Explosive training is not the answer to anything and even the even the power lifters that I train now, and, and one of them basically is seven. Uh, he's sixty uh, six years old, so you got to be careful with the guy. He, he he wants to do it. He's going to do it. He talked me into training him. In fact, I've trained this guy off and on since nineteen sixty three or four. But and we can get him to a contest. He does well, but we don't. We don't. It, it does not enter our mind. How, a correct squat to me is good control. Turn around under control and come on up. And I took t- these two guys went to the contest just to, so. I, so I'm still involved. And no, I, I went to my first contest in 1974. Right, um, but I mean the the pit powerlifting team. You coached that team for over 20 years and won like 19 championships, right? Yeah, well, we, yeah, we won some legitimate ones because I don't think it's legitimate nowadays because you've got so many national championships, so many organizations. We actually competed in the teenage nationals when there was only one on earth. Right. You know, and now if you, have, if you have a guy that, if one of your lifters has a problem with his bench press, because that's one of the lifts that you coach, right? So right. I just want I just want to find out what you would tell a guy who needs help on his bench press? Well, you'd have to look at his technique. And if you can get him to, to, to understand that skill is an extremely important part of any of the lifts, if he will, you know, pick up on the, uh, the, the skill part. And I, I, the, the best assistance exercise to me for the bench is a fairly close grip bench press. And uh, believe it or not, we probably come onto this and by pure accident, we if a guy's having trouble with his bench, I have him stop it about two inches from his chest and pause for a couple of seconds. Like, don't let it on oh. a chest and then push right. it out of that pause as an assistance exercise. That's great. But I'd have to know pretty much if a guy's having trouble how much work he's doing because in most cases, I, you know, the guy I'm training now, he'll do like he, he Friday when he trained, he done a, a, a total after he done he done the deadlift Friday. After he warmed up and done the deadlift, he done he done three assistance exercises and that was it. That's you know I, I just think it if you know I, I'd have to really talk to the guy or see what he was doing, but it, it, less is it, it's hard to get into. Um, <laughs> Uh, I just, I, I don't know how to get a guy to understand. I, I think if you read a lot of the stuff that's out there, you'll just be so encouraged to do more that I would advise you don't even read any of it so that you don't get confused <laughs> and just right. tr- just do things yourself a little bit to see. Test yourself. I can tell by what you just said. I mean, holding the bar off your chest and pausing without hitting your chest, that must be right. brutally hard. Because yeah, a, a lot I, of guys I found out that most lifting. guys, because <clears throat> that when they get it to their chest, they're going to use a little skill out of bottom. So I and I, I just got you know we just come back from other lifters that I trained when we started to doing that. Um, that that w- done the most for them. Now the second thing, now where I get my information is from other guys that I've trained in in, in the greater number. Uh, I don't like to see guys do a real wide 
grip bench competition-wise because it's pretty tough on the shoulders. I have had feedback from guys that say the best bench press routine you put us on the game was, and then they, you know, that, the one I just talked to you about, that uh, pause and about two inches from the chest and then pressing it off and pause a couple seconds. Mm-hmm. And the other one that a guy has always told me worked the best was uh, we done three sets. We done a wide grip, <clears throat> medium grip, and a close grip. And we done that for a while, and guys said that really strengthened them up. Now I haven't done that much here lately with guys, although the one that I'm the, the bencher I'm training. <clears throat> I keep telling him he ought to bench 500 without a shirt, you know, and he can because he's got the body. But I might try that with him, the different grips, but up around 12 reps. Last week you said some interesting stuff. You you, you amazed me when you said a 295-pound bencher that's natural could bench over 500 with drugs and the, and the new bench shirts they got. If you If you were going to take the squat, and compare that natural, just like the bench press. If you take a 500-pound squatter with no super suit, no knee wraps, no drugs, and then you put that, uh, you give him the drugs, the super suit, the wraps, and the full gear, what what could a natural 500-pound squatter do? If he wants to spend, you know, the money and the time, he'd probably be a 1,000-pound squatter. Um I, I picked up, you know, Powerlifting USA is no longer uh, uh, it was a magazine we subscribed to for many years, and um, it's certainly a, a good magazine for powerlifters, but they they had to make a living, and so they had all kind of things in the magazine uh, to do with, uh, you know, equipment. And, you know, I, I can sit back and say I wouldn't do this and wouldn't do that, because now I'm older and I realize it didn't really make any difference uh, to anybody but me. But I, I've got a guy who's in, uh, that I used to be on our team who squatted 805 uh, at, a, at one of the most legitimate contests you can go to. The guy never used drugs. It wasn't even inter- he, he, he wasn't even interested in powerlifting. He was just that good. And he never worked hard in his life, and he's a good guy. You couldn't keep him liking him. He laughs all the time. He jokes. Fun guy to be around. He, with drugs and equipment, I don't know what the guy could have squatted. He'd have probably broke both legs. He'd have been so strong. <laughs> but it's, you know, it, it's just, I mean, I, I look today, I was down at the pit today because I told you last week, I think, I trained these two guys that come over from Illinois and it's such a long drive and they can't get over during the week, so they come over to the father son. Son's an outstanding football player. But I was waiting for them, and I was leafing through the old magazines that are no longer in print, and I was looking at some of the equipment, and, and I, I was still flabbergasted at the new bench shirt, which was a book probably that was five years old that I was looking at a magazine I mean it's just amazing I mean it's like if you have I I don't think I can explain it but if you was to take a big flat band across your chest and hook it to your elbows if you knew how to do that as you come down that band stretches and and it's incredibly tight you got to really be good to get that bench to the right place on your chest or it will kick your shoulders around like something you won't believe. So these guys are really good at using that bench shirt. It's hard to imagine how much it will do for what's you. What's the point? What's the point of it? It doesn't. I guess the only point week. I know anything about, nobody ever made a nickel doing it, and the other point is you just tell your buddy what you benched, and he believes right. in So if you know. could bench 300 natural, you can bench over five with the gear and the drugs, I mean, well, you know, what's the? Do you, do you think, you know, as a as a long time Hall of Fame powerlifting coach, do you think the sport is 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 become ruined by this? Especially absolutely, by the, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Not, there's not a, there, there's no more powerlifters now than there was twenty, thirty years ago because young guys look at that stuff and they first of all they think, well, there's no use in me trying to do it. You got to be Superman. 
and but these guys can't do that. But again, you know, they can't do what the the the, the magazine says they do. But it was more than that. It, it, you know, a, a good team of of guys on steroids right. would get around the. They, they, if you got a thousand pound on a guy, you got to have about a half a dozen spotters. Well, the, the mm-hmm. judges couldn't see what was going on anyway. Guy would always be a couple inches high, with all that equipment on and steroids. And I've seen guys blowing blood out their nose and everything else. You know, blood <laughs> pressure so screaming high. Um, you know, it's it 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 just it it didn't. You know, it was kind of interesting to somebody the first time they seen it, but. In, in the long run, it was not interesting to them because they thought, well, what's this about? These guys are crazy or something, you know. No, the sports... It's had the drugs for a while, but this new gear is just a joke. I know, nobody ever can make any sense out of it. Um, I, I can honestly say, though, you know, there's a lot of powerlifters at the pit yet, and I hardly see... The, I, what i done, the first thing i done to, to to help it was I removed all the old records. I hate it in a sense. Uh, we, we we had these big, real painted up nice record boards, which I think is very important. It was very important that I had that kind of help coaching. I mean, when a guy sees his name in big letters, and if I'd have had the money, I'd have had a. I always told guys I'd have something down on the highway, and we'd put it on a computer, and what whoever made the best lift that day would be on the highway. And in fact, one time I had a billboard when we won a one of our first meets, big time meets, I had a billboard that had the guy's names on it. It cost me a lot of money on my pocket, but I knew that motivated guys. Well, we had these the best squat in each weight class, huge boards, painted up by professional, bench, deadlift. And guys liked their name on there because we were about the only ball game in town at that time too. Well, I realized the the way to do away with Drugs that had infiltrated us a little bit was just take out the equipment. No more equipment will go on that wall there. And so I had to start all over and put guys on the the record board without equipment. So guys that use the steroids use equipment. You can go to the bank on it. Thanks a lot, Dick, for being on the show. Thank you, Bob. And our next guest is my friend Drew Israel, also known as the Human Wall. And, uh, Drew, before I introduce you, uh, hey, Steve, if you're listening, Drew is a huge barbecue fan. <laughs> they have great barbecue in Memphis, right? They're fa- famous for that. But maybe Drew ought to visit you. Uh, he came down here and surprised me because we all know the stories of Drew eating 70-ounce 70, 70 steaks. Well, when, when Drew came down here, he said, do you have any barbecue places around here? One of the best barbecue places in Florida is right in Fort Pierce. It's called Tillman's, and everyone around here goes there, and people drive from all over the state to go there. So I took Drew there, and he was just, he was in heaven. And we went there three times while he was here for a week. Drew is an internationally known strength expert. He's also one of the strongest drug-free guys you'll ever find. He knows more about machines than just about anybody. Yo, Drew, welcome back. Hey, Bob, thank you, and I want to thank Dick and Steve. I enjoyed listening to both of them. Um, you know, I used to find, it's funny, you were talking about the, the, the bench press, and I usually found that if there was a favorite, like a favorite for the team or the gym at a meet, he would do a three-quarter bench press where his arms would come up three-quarters, and they'd say, racket, and he'd get two, 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 two white lights. <laughs> And I always found that it was kind of funny because a lot of the competitors, their arms were still bent at the elbow, and they didn't they didn't really lock it out. So the the entire sport, the entire sport is so suspect that no one can say they're the best lifter in any category because there's so many there's, there's so many inconsistencies that it makes it impossible. Depends on the judges. Depends on the judges. There, there are just judges who will turn down perfect lifts simply because they want a uh, lift to X to win. Right. And uh, yeah, so it's it's. Uh, and I always found in the bench press, you know, I did a lot of the same things in terms of stopping the bar an inch or two from my chest. I would do that, and I, I found it really it really helped my lifts overall. And I would make sure I just didn't do it too much and burn out. But I would do that in conjunction with uh, pull ups and push ups. 
I would sometimes do the, do a push set of 30 push-ups and go right into the bench. I'd have three people spotting me. And if, if I couldn't come back up, fine. I would lower it negative style. And they'd lift it up, and I'd come back down and do five reps like that, negative style, then jump back and do 30 more push-ups. And, uh, you know, I'd get all this work done. I, wanna, I would want to get the workout done within, like, 10 or 12 minutes so I wouldn't burn out, and, and I could come back four days later and train again. But it, it, it really helped me. It, 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 my bench press flew up every time I did these routines like that. And, Drew, what was your motivation behind your involvement in strength training? Well, originally, you know, when I first started, I had hurt my back a lot playing basketball. I had a, a, a number of injuries, and I really loved playing basketball. But I, every time I was playing towards the end, because I, was, I banged bodies a lot, I was very physical, and I, I was playing against good ball players, and I just my low back would go out on me. And it, I was getting worse and worse, so I, I, it was a time where I had to always crawl out of bed. Uh, well, I actually had to crawl out of bed. I couldn't put my shoes on or socks on, and I just really, uh, I really wanted to change it any way I could. So when I started the strength training, the first few times I got injured, which is normal because I was coming in injured and I was used to being injured, and old patterns take a little bit of time to break. Once I started, though, on routines, and I started to talk to different people, and I finally started to get the sanity of lifting down because there's a huge, like I said last week, there's a huge fa- fraction uh, of lifters who are uh, who are uh, insane. And I, I, I mean, so it, it, it's you know sometimes you know you'll look at somebody and they'll be talking to them, and I'll be shaking my head up and down. But, you know, really I'm thinking to myself, how can I, I, I want to get away as fast as possible. The guy's nuts. And, and, and what happened is, though, uh, so I started to get on good routines, and the routines started to work, and I didn't, I didn't start to get as many back injuries. They started to get less and less, and I started to get, instead of a full-blown back injury, I'd get a back strain. And I kept learning about ice and heat, put, applying ice and heat to my back, and uh, basketball I just couldn't do because the impact of coming down off, off a rebound onto my feet. Because I played basketball, I weighed 245. So it, it was still a heavy weight. I could run real fast, but it was a heavy weight. And, you know, and when I would come down with a 6'10 guy hanging on my back, it's, you know, all that banging would injure my back so I'd get crippled. So I had to switch, and, I, and I, then I started to love lifting. And once I loved it, I start to really get into the ins and outs of why I'm doing such each exercise and what I can get out of it, and my back started to get better and better so that I didn't I didn't stay in a bed for three months or two and a half months because I played with the injury. I was so crazy, I would play with back injuries. We'll be back with more right after this. This segment brought to you by VitalNutritionStore.com. Did you know that more than 7 million Americans suffer from coronary heart disease, the most common form of heart disease? Regardless of your age or condition, adding Cardio for Life to your daily regime will dramatically improve your cardiovascular condition. Cardio for Life has been the top-selling Enlarger 9 product in the marketplace now for more than three years. It is also the top-selling product at VitalNutritionStore.com. Formulated by Dr. Harry Elwart, the best-selling author of Let's Stop the Number One Killer of Americans Today, Dr. Harry believes together we can prevent and reverse heart disease. Cardio for Life comes in three wonderful flavors, orange, peach, and grape, and is gluten-free, sugar-free, and sodium-free. Please see our complete line of natural products at vitalnutritionstore.com. That's V-I-T-A-L nutritionstore.com. Randy Roach shocked the world with the release of his first volume of Muscle Smoke and Mirrors several years ago. It was a masterpiece of over 500 pages with such in-depth research and detail that it was not only surprising, but shocking and mind-blowing. It was truly one of the best Iron Game history books ever written. He followed that with Volume 2, another epic book with over 700 pages of equal depth and detail. All serious Iron Game fans need to have these books. Please visit Randy's website at randyroach.ca. That's R-A-N-D-Y-R-O-A-C-H dot C-A. 
Listen to how Iron Game legend and the Iron Master editor, Osmo Kihaw, describes the book Supernatural Strength. Have you ever wondered how much real-world experience authors have when they write books about weight training? Who is that person behind the computer? What do they really know about the Iron Game? If you picked up this book, Supernatural Strength, you have definitely come to the right place. The author, Bob Whalen, has spent several decades in the Iron Game trenches training himself, competing and coaching in powerlifting, earning academic credentials too numerous to mention, and thousands of hours of training and instructing athletes and trainees of all levels at his Washington, D.C. gym since 1990. He's not only devoted his life to motivating and pushing people to heights they have never been to, but elevating the trainees' understanding why certain methods work better than others. Bob is one of the most respected and revered trainers in the business today. This book is sure to surprise and amaze you at the same time. Order now at SupernaturalStrength.com. That's SupernaturalStrength.com. Don't you think it would be so much easier getting into shape if you had a personal coach? Just like all the celebrities do. Well, now you can. Bob Whalen of WebStrengthCoach.com wants to get you out of your rut and coach you to success. He's dedicated to helping you achieve your strength and fitness goals through your hard work and his expert guidance. Bob will help you with strength training, muscle building, fitness, nutrition, and motivation. He'll make sure you achieve your maximum physical potential. You can get one-on-one training with Bob through his website webstrengthcoach.com he will develop a personalized program tailored to your individual needs a program right for you bob will give you feedback after every workout this is old school fitness and nutrition no fads and no gimmicks bob will use proven natural techniques to make sure you are satisfied so visit webstrengthcoach.com today and let bob help you reach your best self webstrengthcoach.com Do you enjoy history without social engineering? Reading about our founding fathers? Economics from a capitalist perspective? Wisdom from modern patriots? Welcome to UncleSamBooks.com, where virtues like rugged individualism, hard work, and the American dream dominate. UncleSamBooks.com. Great books for homeschooling. UncleSamBooks.com. If you want to become as strong and muscular as possible with health in mind and without lowering yourself to using steroids, the best advice can be found in the classic strongman books of long ago. These are the best books ever written on the subjects of strength training, weightlifting, strongman training, iron game history, and old time physical culture. Many of them can still be found at physicalculturebooks.com. There you will find good, Honest, time-tested wisdom from the great old-time strong men. To maximize your natural muscular and strength potential, please visit physicalculturebooks.com. Listen to Ken Manny, head strength and conditioning coach at Michigan State University, describe the book Iron Nation. A masterpiece text on some of the most intriguing and compelling personal stories, iron game history, and gut-wrenching training routines ever put to paper. If you truly love hard training without all the frills of pomp and circumstance so common today, you will love Iron Nation. Written by lifters for lifters. If you love weight training, you will love Iron Nation. Order now at ironnation.com. That's I R O N nation.com. If you would like to promote your business on MindForce Radio, we would love to hear from you. Please let us know if you are interested in a 30 or 60 second voice commercial or a banner website ad. Please contact Bob using the contact information provided on MindForceRadio.com. You're listening to Natural Strength Night on MindForce Radio. I didn't even take the. I played with the old timers, and some of those guys are very salty. And they'd have me out there playing, even even though I I was almost dragging my right leg. 
And, mm-hmm. you know, in retrospect, I would never do, have done that, but I was young, and I looked up to some of these guys. They were famous ball players, and, and they really wanted me for their own they wanted me for their own personal use so they could have somebody on their team who could hustle back on defense and and do certain things but i i you know i really got i got so hurt that the saving saved my the lifting saved my life and if it wasn't for the lifting i don't think my back ever would have gotten better i was just going to be i'd be spinning my wheels i probably would have gone for back surgery and i avoided all of that stuff through through uh weightlifting it it really is a wonderful activity for helping the back people always think don't lift you'll hurt your back if you learn how to do it and when to do it and what to do you won't hurt your back you'll just help your back i've learned uh, some, some people you know you, you know you got to realize some people are going to be big they're going to want to talk a lot and i i get talkers the talkers you got to look you got to kind of set the rules right away that you're there to train and you're going to train them, and, and they, they, you have to stop them from communicating. You still communicate the entire half hour. And uh, also, you know, uh, then the ones who you know are lying about their lifts, you ask them, what do you, what, what, what do, you do in your lifts? Because you want to have an idea of their health also. I ask about their physical fitness, their backs, their knees. And you, what I learned is you can't go by what someone says because a lot of them just won't tell you the truth. And I don't, I don't need to find out with them getting an injury. So I would start everyone conservatively and, you know, and see what they could handle and what they could do. And that's how I would decide, like, uh, what routines I'm going to give them. Uh, can they do six exercises or, or is it better for them to do three? I, uh, you know, hard gainers, and I, I would get hard gainers who would come in and all they, they were so nervous, all they would do is tell me how hard a gainer they were. And and uh, it's all right. You know, I would let them know it's all right. I'm not judging them. I'm just training them. You know, and I really wasn't judging them. I couldn't care less. You know, other than wanting people to do good, I couldn't care less what they lift. You know, I want them to get stronger. I want them to do good, but it, it's never with a bad intention. It's always with a good intention. So when someone is nervous, a male, I get a male and he's nervous that I'm going to judge him. Uh, men go through, I think a lot of lifters go through that. A lot of male lifters go through that. I think the women lifters, the female lifters, I think they're a little easier on each other than the male lifters when it comes to uh, talking about the lifting. You know, the, the, the women, I've trained women, and I, I found that they weren't as nervous about telling me what they lift, and they were more accurate. They gave me a, a real appraisal of what they could do, and I found it to be very true. So... Uh, yeah, I, I, I learned. I learned just you can't take a person at their word, even if they're the nicest person in the world, because they're going to be nervous, and, and a lot of people just can't help it. They'll tell you things that aren't true. So you know, it's a great learning school. Lifting is a, you learn so much about people. The first time I see them, I, I have a way of just I can size someone up pretty close just by looking at them, and then I I guess conservatively, and I usually. Whatever I think they can get for like ten reps on any certain lift, I'm, I'm usually a pretty good guesser. And then I go lighter, and I have them do a set to failure. Then usually they're going to do somewhere like ten to fifteen reps. But based on that test set, I can kind of tell where to start working them out at. But I do the same thing as you. I never listen to what they say. Right, right, right. I mean, especially with free weights, forget about it. It's like you'll have people tell you what they can squat, and they're just like cracking their knees, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, all the though. time, all all the time. True. So, yeah. so yeah, you never listen to what they tell you. So I, I agree no. on that. Drew, what 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 are the what are some of the early uh, earliest uh, role models that you've had? I know some of the strong men you admired. Um, we well, were just talking about that a couple of days ago, but who are the, some of the ones that you admired the most? Well, I always, I always like Marvin Eater. He, 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 the man is, is so strong, and he didn't weigh a lot, and he did su- such impressive things that I was always uh, taken with with him as, as a lifter, and I always wanted to follow. You know, if he if anything was written about him, what he did, what he was dipping, you know, how much weight was t- attached. Did he do an 800 pound dip? I just was, you know, I found it to be interesting. Marvin Eater was uh, someone who. You know, I uh, I looked up to. Also, the, the earliest guy, one of the earliest guys, Herman Garner. Now, Garner was six one, two hundred and ninety pounds, and he would lift with one of those fat bars that had no revolving sleeves. At that time period, 
in the early 19... I mean, it must have been, I'm guessing, about 1918. The thing didn't... So the, the, there, were, there were no movable sleeves. They were just, like, in one place, and they weren't going anywhere. And the bars were probably two and a quarter inch in diameter. And he would actually take take a bar like this, a dead, completely dead fat bar, and he deadlifted 900 with it. And he would wow. do that, and he would do this. It's, it's, it's frightening to think if he had been a steroid user and he had had a suit on, this guy would have done 1350, 1400. I mean, it would have been it's just amazing. He bench pressed on a kitchen table, which is, I think is insane. He would have, because that table falls, he's going to kill himself. But he did 600 using one of those fat bars again on a kitchen table wearing a wrestling singlet. I mean, he, wow. was, just ama- he, was, ama- he was just an amazingly strong... I, I rate him as one of the maybe the, the three or four strongest men, you know, men uh, who ever showed up to lift the weight. Marvin Eater probably, yeah, pound for pound, was the best. And uh, Gorner was unbelievable, too. But you, yeah. you, you picked two of the best right there. Yeah, those, those two guys, I, I really... I like looking at the Gorner book every so often, you know, and rereading some of it. He had a strongman show where he'd have people try to lift lift like a stone that he would lift, and no one could ever lift what he could lift. He would always invariably lift the stone with ease. And this guy, I mean, this guy was doing things that, like Bill Kazmaier on drugs, was barely doing. And this would be like wow. drugs and, and wearing a suit. He was doing this in a wrestling singlet, and they didn't even know what steroids was. So uh, he truly was a special man. Expand on some of the uh, training partners you've had over the years, good ones, bad ones, you know, which ones oh, yeah, you learned sure. the most from. I know you trained for a while with Jim Duggan, and you said you told me how he pushed you a lot. Yeah, J- Jim pushed a lot. Jim's very, very strong. Jim's an extremely strong guy, and he was a good training partner. He was supportive, and uh, I had some good workouts with Jim. He, uh, he bought into the abbreviated training, and he liked it, and... Uh, yeah, we pushed each other. He was a, he was a great training partner to have because, you know, we never knew what was going to happen on our deadlift days. We each pushed each other. You know, we'd push each other for reps, and um, it was a lot of fun. You know, because he wasn't he, he wasn't a big mouth. He was very very he was he was very um, sincere in what he says, and he didn't go out of his way to try to mess with someone's head. He was a great he was a great training partner. I also tried Frank Savino who. Uh, Another guy who he has a gym out in Queens. He trained with me for a while, and Frankie weighed about 290, and he was 5'11, and he wasn't fat. He was in great shape, and no steroids. And Frank was, Frank was, well, he was strong. He did, uh, I think he did 15 reps once with uh, 320 in the bench. He was strong. He just had a high level of natural strength, and he uh, he was fun to train with too. I've I've been fortunate that the three or four training partners who were my primary partners have been really have been really supportive and have really pushed me and now i'm training with my friend duncan who you know he trains he trains hard he, he trains really hard he's once it, you know it takes a little time sometimes for someone to learn they have to see it that training hard if you tell someone to train hard and they're not used to training hard they're going to train harder than they're used to training but it may be a far cry from training hard Someone who wants to train hard should watch somebody who knows how to train hard, and then they'll, then they'll understand what hard training is. I think it's a learned resp- response. You really have to see someone do it. And uh, that even includes reading about it. You read about it, you get a sense of it, but it's really important to see it. So Duncan now is training all out. He's, you know, he's killing himself, and he trains, he'll train twice a week, and his workouts take maybe 10, 12 minutes, and... Uh, yeah, so he, he's a he's a really good training partner to have. I'm happy I'm training with him. How did you evolve out of some of the training myths? Because uh, you told me recently that when you first started out, like most of us, you know, you didn't train properly. You still got results, but then uh, then you saw the light. So uh, tell us how you evolved out of some of the myths you were involved. Oh, in. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, you know, in, in in one of the first gyms I went to, you know, I was being told to do ten or twelve sets of bench pressing, and uh, you know, they were telling me to do like six sets of each exercise. If you, if you counted them up with a calculator, you'd probably have 36 sets, 40 sets. It was insane. I spent 90 minutes doing this stuff, I, and, it was, and the training was terrible because 
um, I had very bad people uh, around me training. They would train and move the ball three inches off their chest and then bounce it off their chest, move it up five inches, bounce it off their chest, and they were not doing one legit repetition. I didn't have role models at that time. When I first started training, I can't tell you, my, all my back injuries were a direct result of not having role models. As soon as I saw a role model and started to learn, it was a whole different story. But in the first gym I was at, it was just a, it was just a, a den, a, a den, den of iniquity. They, everyone in that place just uh, did things with self motivation. And 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 another thing that I can't stand, which bothers me a lot, when you're training in these gyms and you, you're watching people do terrible things, and then you think that's how the way it should be done. One guy I tell I have a bad back that it's been pretty acute. It's been hurting me. He says, oh, I know what to do. If you want to get rid of it, you've you got to do bent over rows. <laughs> now, I, at the time, my back was barely held, being held up, I told him. I told him, well, you know, it really hurts. I get really bad back injuries. Oh, and really go, add more weight and, and do some good bent over rows. You know, I learned, the, I learned the hard way. I learned through getting injured and learning a maniac from a maniac. You know, I, I, I started to be able to differentiate between someone who's off the wall and someone who's not. Uh, and in gyms, if you ever go in a gym, uh, unless the unless it's a good practitioner who owns that gym and he and he really stays on top of it, which I would definitely do, a lot of the lifters they never they never clean up. They leave all their stuff all over the place. You go on bench, you see a bench press. The weight, the weights are on the bench. Tons of weight on the deadlift bar on the floor. The squat rack is packed with weight, and you'll have a whole gym of people doing this. I'd rather give up the membership than have, than have to sit behind that desk and watch someone do that. It would really bother me, you know, because it's a totally selfish act. So that some next dude who wants to do, train has to give up, has to give up like carrying some plates that he may not even be barely able to do. He has to carry them at chest height and slide them off one by one. And if it's a really strong lifter who's on steroids, there may be six, seven, eight plates on each side, and the guy, the poor guy, has to carry them. So I I I I learned that um, I want to clean up after myself. That one I just just watched other people, and I thought it was disgusting. So it was pretty easy for me to change up. And yeah, so I learned I learned I learned through everything through experimentation the hard way. Like a lot of times, getting my back injured because some guy tells me to do bent over rows or good mornings. So my back, sure, my back would get injured. Uh, but once I really started to learn. Uh, it didn't happen anymore. You know, I, I, that's when I started to be able to, you know, lift weights, really lift weights, rather than just try to survive a workout and pray. But, you know, when I first started lifting, you know, I would take what, what, what for me would end up being a very light weight. I, did, I would deadlift, let's say, 315, 320, and it would injure my back. I would get injured, and I shouldn't have been doing that. What I should have been doing is, the bar and maybe one plate on each side and learning proper technique and just building up a, ba a real strong base so that when I start to lift heavy weights, my back will now be used to taking, taking on the responsibility of a, of a heavy load. And uh, I learned to do that through mistakes, through actually listening to some of the people. Drew, for the final question, what makes you get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to polish your new pit shark machine? What makes you love strength training so much, and what are some of the, the great benefits you get from it? Well, I love, I love lifting. It's a good feeling when you lift. I, I think anyone who lifts after a while, especially when they're making gains, gets a really good feeling. And I love equipment. I've always loved equipment. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I get up and I'll uh, stand on some of the machines I like at 3 in the morning. You know, especially... <laughs> especially uh, you know, when I get a new machine, if it's a good one, I, I love I love equipment, and the benefits have been I I don't have you know I I was, I'm able over the last decade to walk around injury free. I never thought there'd be a day when I'd be able to walk around and train weights twice a week and not get injured, and be able to go all out. I learned how to build up tolerances in my own body so I can do different exercises, and I've learned when to take a rest. If I don't feel right one day, it's no big deal. You know, I have a log. I've logged. I've logged every workout I ever do. But the thing is, it's still it's just a date on a log. If I need to move it two days, three, four days later, because I just have a funny feeling about my back, 
I'll do it. Instead of doing it in three days, I'll do it in nine days. It doesn't really matter. The point is to be able to lift and not get hurt, and, and I'll make progress doing this. That's how I also learned that you need very little exercise. When I would have problems with my back and I'd only lift once every seven or eight days and see that, hey, man, I really did good, and I haven't lifted in eight days. You know, there was no atrophy. I, I did good. And when I started to feel that, I could actually start to have full workouts and not worry about uh, how much time I took in between. It really freed me up. And then I was no longer a slave to, uh, to a, a workout log. And so many lifters in this day and age, I'm sure this still goes on in gyms, they're slaves to their workout logs. You know, if it says Tuesday, they're going to lift on Tuesday even though they broke their wrist. And, you know, it's, you know they're, they're just slaves to doing things a certain way, and they can't handle hearing anything. I never talk, I never preach. I never would go in a gym and, and preach to some lifter. He says, I've been stuck for seven weeks on my bench press. You know, I would never preach to him what he could do to get out of it and start making fast progress. Because when you do that anyway, and you weren't asked, they resent you. One, they resent you for, for telling them that. And two, they won't believe you anyway. So it has to be someone who comes to me and would ask me, then I'd be more than happy to uh, uh, tell them that. Well, thanks for your answers, Drew. And uh, I want to thank Steve Baldwin, Dick Connor, and Drew Israel for coming on the show tonight. Great job, you guys, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you, Bob. See you, Bob. Thanks a lot, Bob. I appreciate it. Don't be a flamingo, you have to do your squats. Don't be a flamingo, real lifters work their legs. That's going to do it for this edition of Natural Strength Night on MindForceRadio.com. Please bookmark that website, MindForceRadio.com. Bob is always looking for new writers for NaturalStrength.com who are old school, hardcore, write with passion and have a strong anti-steroid stance. He also wants your training questions so they can be answered on the show. Please send your articles and training questions to Bob at MindForceRadio at Earthlink.net. Thanks for listening. See you next time.